welcome to this new course of human rights. Now I change all my presentations as you can see. <laughs> now, sorry, yeah. Now in this new week of human rights, we will see some battles, yeah, not paintings but battles battles no <laughs> each week we will see the history of one battle no? uh, well, uh, and then we will explain so many things about human rights the first lectures will be about uh, the philosophy and also the uh, the obligations to fulfill, to obey human rights, to respect, protect. And finally, we will see the organization of, of entities, the international organization, uh, I'll, um, also some institutions, NGOs, in the countries, how it works. And in, then, after this, theoretical part of well, the organization, the theory, and the treaties and declarations, we will see one by one the most important human rights that we can find now in the international treaties of human rights. As you see, well, we will see so many things. <laughs> it's to, I, I, I think that you will appreciate so, so many things. No? So, uh, now, for today, we will begin with the theoretical part, no? The human rights notions will be the first topic of today. Notion and foundation. Something uh, we have seen in the last lecture of jurisprudence. And we will remember so many things there, because it's quite connected, the last lecture, with this subject. Yeah, obviously this will be more uh, based in the treaties and in the declarations, international declarations and the human rights on jurisprudence are more, more philosophical as you know. Then we will see the concept of Duke's cogence and how it applies to human rights and the problems of this concept in the International Courts of Human Rights. And finally, I don't know if not today, uh, well, this week, probably we can see something about the principle of equality and proportionality, quite connected with the lesson that we will see today. So, after this, let's begin with the first learning object of today, the human rights notion and the human rights foundation. And for this, the best thing is to uh, think about uh, this battle, a battle that happened in the end of the 18th century. I don't know if any one of you, this is the map of Europe, as you know, but at the end of the 18th century. Don't you know which battle could be with this year? <laughs> any one of you? What happened at that time? Yes, Elvis. Oh, just an attempt. I'm thinking it's the French Revolution. Yeah, okay, good, good. Exactly, exactly. We will see exactly this. And who is this? <laughs> the King of France, one of the most powerful kings at that time, uh, Louis XVI. So, Let's see, yeah. Uh, so what happened at that time? Well, so many things we will see uh, here. 
uh, it was a, he was a great queen uh, uh, with a great power. At that time, probably France was the biggest uh, potency of the world, <laughs> no? with a great power in, in the whole Europe and the whole the world. Uh, France was a very uh, big country in all senses, no? with land, but also with people. Uh, at that time, uh, France could have 26 million people living there. No? So, on the other country, less than the, the, the half, imagine that, no? uh, more or less. So, with a lot of people, um, with a lot of problems, especially at that time. What happened in the uh, years before to the French Revolution? Because we, we have to understand that to understand history, no? Uh, one of the first, first things is the, that in the last three, four more or less uh, centuries, a new class in the society appears. The class of the bourgeoisie, the people that have some uh, industry, some farms, some many uh, money, power, but power, economical power. Huh? Uh, at that time, for example, in, in those centuries, uh, appears a great family in France, the Medici family. The Medici family uh, had a bank, a very incredible bank, no? And at one point, that family was more powerful than so many lords, so many kings around uh, the whole Europe. Imagine that more power and on the other hand there there is a decrease of the power of the of the nobility no? yeah, of the kings because they don't have sometimes money and have to ask so many favors to the uh, the bourgeoisie to the people with money and that's why it's the, the, the times changes a lot so we can say uh, that the, this is a new actor in the in the history of the world, the world bourgeoisie. Then, in the last century before uh, the French Revolution, uh, happened so many things. One of the things is the Anglo-French War a great war with Britain, <laughs> with London, with the king of, of, of the UK. So, and what happened with that? Well, as in any war, what happened? Well, you lose a, a lot of money. A lot of money is just like put all your treasures or your economy uh, very near with a bomb and to explode. All of these disappear. Then all the the treasures, all the money, all the power disappears. Simply disappear, no? In a in a in a war, no? especially with the UK, a great island, <laughs> no? Then in the last ten uh, years, no? Before the, the the French Revolution, there was a big crisis, big big crisis, no? Uh, because uh, because the war, because the, so many things, uh, the new laws also, the new arrangement of, of France, uh, and there was a lot of uh, food crisis, now poverty around the, the the biggest country in population at that time. No? Uh, then the, the the year before, precisely before, imagine that, to the French Revolution, a new thing happened, no? a severe winter, no? a severe winter that destroyed all the farms also. Uh, people have no food at all <laughs> and not a way of survive 
in order to get money in some in any case. That's why all these kind of things. Uh, it's clear that the king needed uh, taxes the same year in 1789. In that year, well, uh, the king, the most powerful king of Europe, decided, well, I have to ask uh, taxes. No? The way uh, the system of taxes at that time was a little uh, different, no? Each parliament, a parliament is, is a province, is a department more, more or less, used to ask their own uh, taxes, no? But the king of France, uh, to impose the taxes to whole France, need to convoke, to ask, that, uh, to convey the start general, uh, the general states, the general state. So in my uh, five of that year, of that year, Louis XVI convey the uh, the states, general states, in a uh, great palace. At that time, the biggest one of the Europe, and I think that until today it could be. Yeah, Versailles. Uh, where is uh, well? You can see here, no, very near from Paris. If you one day go to Paris, you have to go to to the Palace of Versailles <laughs> because it's so incredible, for so incredible, it's, and it's so close. No, you, you take the train, and in a few minutes you will be there for half an hour. I don't know. Uh, so, what is the general state? I don't know if any one of you know uh, how many states there could be. No one of you <laughs> want to try. Nope. Okay, so uh, what is a state? Well, it's a class, more or less. It's a class. Uh, and th at that time, the state were three classes. Three classes, no? There's class, uh, the nobility. The nobility. Nobility at that time could be more or less half a million people. 400,000 people, exactly, you know? Uh, so, including women and children, obviously, you know? But uh, under the principle of feudal precedent, they were not taxed. That's incredible, no? <laughs> then, then the second, or first, uh, whatever you want, uh, state or class, was the clergy. At that time, uh, 100,000 uh, clergy, uh, more or less. So between the first two, two classes, or two states, uh, probably could be half a million. No? And remember that France, at that time, had 26 million people. No? So the, the third state, uh, was more than 25 million people, no? Uh, well, in more or less, because in the third state at the time it was the bourgeoisie, you know, and the citizens, you know, the citizens, no? Probably bourgeoisie, the peasant, and everyone in France, no? Obviously, not all of them, they, they, they have a right to be there, no? That's why after more than a century appears the fourth state, no? The proletariat, <laughs> the workers, and uh, so many. But at that time, just three states, three states. So what else happened? That in May 28, 
CSG uh, ask to come to convey well uh, to the, the third state uh, asked to appear there. No? He brought a, a great essay not so long called the third state. Uh, the third precisely the third state. Why? Uh, because he he realized that things are going not so well. <laughs> Uh, well, um, probably the, the polit politics at that time was so different. No? For example, he said, no, uh, we, all we are equal. But there is a problem because a few people that are less than the 10% the of the population, more or less, and he said that, uh, are governing uh, the whole population. No? So, uh, and if you are equal, well, we have to decide all with the same vote, no? with the same number. Then he says, well, the less, the, the nobility and the clergy are uh, the less part of the people. Instead of that, they have more power. So they are less if they are not good. We have to go against them. And then, well, he, he developed some concept for the constitutional law theory as a original power to constitute a state, uh, the constitutional power to give a constitution. He divided no? the original and the derivate original, a constitutional power. No? Well, probably in this notion you have seen or you will see in, in constitutional law, no, the the constitutional power and the, the two types, no, classes, the original and the and the derivative constitutional power. But in any case, he was one of the developers of that concept, the principal one, uh, Emmanuel Seyer. Uh, so, what happened? Uh, that. Uh, we will see with a more a more detail in the next slides. No, that in Jan 17 there was a autoproclamation of the third state in the National Assembly. Um, we will see, and then soon, well, the tennis court hold. No, so oh, this is the general state, not the National Assembly. This is the general state two concepts so different, General Assembly and a General State. As you can see, here are the nobility, yeah? And in the middle, the king, no? Louis XVI. You can find here all the clergy, no? and here at, at the right, well, the, the nobility, no? The nobility will be this, the clergy here, and the third state, you can see all of them here, all of them here. No? So it, it is quite important, no? because the general state, there were centuries ago, uh, the general states, no? but because the, the king has so, had so many power, in the last century, they never asked to meet the general states. So more than two, three centuries, yeah, uh, uh, there were no general states in France. But they wait until that time, that moment. And in th those centuries and happened so many things around the world. For example, in the UK, the, the British king, the British king, uh, more or less in the history, it happened exactly the same. No? The king, the English king needed, the British king needed some taxes. He asked the general states that represent the whole uh, Britain. So, but at, at one point, uh, that was in, in the beginning, well, in the middle of the 14th century, but the nobility decide not to talk with the <laughs> common people, with the commoners, no? 
with the third state. And at that time, in, in this secu uh, 14th century, century uh, they, they have not had so much power. So, and that's why now in the UK, there are two houses, no? uh, the lower house and the higher house. No? Uh, well, and in the lower, there are the commoners. Well, and, 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 the, and the nobility asked to the people, well, I don't want to discuss with you all the laws. You decide the things that you want, and after you decide, you pass me your conclusions, and I will approve or not. These are the words of the nobility, of the parliament, of the UK, in the century 14. And they divided to, 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 to levels, well, as you know, uh, the commoners and the higher uh, house room in, an, in another room also, uh, that is now the, 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 are the, the lords huh? um, until today. Well, with that lesson of the history, in France, they decided to do exactly the same the nobility, no? And they say, well, let's divide uh, in two rooms this, no? And if you want to, 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 to decide something, you can decide something, but after you, your decision, you have to give us your conclusions and we will, we will see if we approve or not, no? So the first and the second state uh, was uh, in another, were in another room, in another place, uh, in another house, even. Uh, but but the times were so different at the, uh, in the French Revolution, in the end of the 18th century, because the bourgeoisie had a lot of power. There were a lot of new ideas, the ideas of the uh, in this century of the light. <laughs> I don't know if it is the lights, but in any case, I'm not sure, but that, that uh, they call them like that, no? the century of the lights. No? So, uh, but when, when, when they separate, what happened? So uh, the, the, the lower court, the lower, the lower uh, house, the commoners, the commoners, the bourgeoisie and the people, said, no, we will uh, auto-proclaim in national assembly. And if you want to follow us, the, the commoners said to the, to the lords and to, well, to, the, to the nobility and to the clergy, if you want to decide anything, well, you can join with us and we will give you the same vote. You will have not so much power. At that time, uh, it was so strong because uh, well, imagine uh, the commoners have no no power, no. Uh, instead of that, the the nobility has the whole power, no. And now the things are changed, no. Changed a lot. Uh, well, the third state was represented by almost six hundred people. So, so there, there were a lot of people, yeah, if you can compare with the nobility, no? Uh, well, so that's why, that's why uh, at the very beginning, um, the nobility have no power uh, to do anything. And at one point in John 20, in a room that is called the tennis court oath, why tennis court, uh, well, the uh, tennis court room, no? Because in that room, in that room uh, they played tennis, no? so different tennis at that time. No? Uh, well, a kind of tennis. Uh, so they decide, they decide uh, in June 20 to give uh, to France, a new constitution, national assembly, new national assembly with the commoners 
uh, remember, swore not to separate them until they had given France a constitution. So, and at the very beginning, at the very beginning, they, they were alone, that National Assembly. Then the, the nobility used to follow uh, uh, the clergy, most of the clergy, well, it followed at the very beginning, then was not so clear. Well, in any case, what happened? That after a month, well, obviously, uh, that assembly uh, wrote some constitution, but after a month of that, in July 12th, there were rumors. The assembly went, uh, and they, they, they heard no, that the king is afraid. And that's why he want to dissolve, to destroy, to, to stop the National Assembly. And probably they think he would uh, send the Swiss Guard forces to close the National Assembly. And with that in mind, some people uh, uh, made the first uh, battle. The fierce battle was not so incredible, but was a symbol. Symbol uh, is always a little thing, but represents so much, so much. And that is the storming of the Bastille. Two days later, in the afternoon of July 14, that year, some guards or some people or some followers of the commoners decide to attack a prison. <laughs> this castle was a prison. Was a prison. It's just a prison. Obviously not just a prison because a prison principal no? is a it is a medieval armory, a fortress and a political prison. No? La Bastille, and represents the, the, why there, why there, and not in any other place, because it represents the royal authority in the middle of Paris, in the middle. If you see the map, where, where it is, in the middle, just in the middle of Paris. So, at that point, imagine that. No, it contains only seven men, seven <laughs> political prisoners. No, but. It was seen uh, as a symbol you know, of the monarchy abuses. Uh, uh, well, um, they decide to attack them and to say to the king, "Well, we don't, we will never stop uh, the the this uh, the program to give to France a constitution and to put the same fierce laws of the new regime." So, what happened after that? This is a great painting, no? very famous. No? They arrest the governor of the of that fortress. It's, he he was called Bernard René Jourdain, Marquis de, de Lanois. Uh, so uh, you can see him. Bernard René is this guy. No, uh, you can see it in that. He have another kind of, of dress, <laughs> yeah, of a loyal, and, a, and they executed him in the that day. No, uh, executed. No? <laughs> uh, uh, the first novel executed in this revolution. So you can see, well, that there was not a great battle, but so many times it happened, especially on human rights. No. You can see, for example, so many battles around the world with more people dead, <laughs> with all more armies, with millions of people, no? but not so significant to the, for the history of humanity. Here, instead of that, is a little battle, but with a lot of repercussions, because uh, behind that battle, there were so many ideas ideas of the, that we are all equal, we have the same rights, we have to promote uh, democracy, 
the ancient re regime should pass, and so many things, no? so many ancient things. The, the essay of CJ, remember, no? uh, we have the same right uh, to vote equally, all of us. Well, so many ideas behind this little button that change a lot no? uh, the history of humanity. So, the National Assembly, after that, uh, approved this document in August 26, well, a month later, a month later, no? a great uh, a document that you for sure know something about this. I, I hope so. No? The, well, let's see. No, I was trying to find something. Well, in any case, the what well, the Constitution of France was well, uh, later approved, and the droit de l'homme, the the rights of the men and the citizen, the citizen. So here you have the document, no? The constitution, but first of the uh, of the constitution, the, the rights, and it is very very interesting, no? Because uh, today there is not uh, no any right in the French French constitution, no uh, a bill of rights at the beginning, as you have in the Kenyan constitution and so many countries. No, there is no 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 list of rights. But in a judgment of the principal court of France, they decide by a judgment to include this uh, list, this bill, bill of rights of that time, 1789, in the, in the constitution, say, because it is mentioned in the preamble of the constitutions, this bill of rights and two others. No? And that's why implicitly the Constitution of France have a list of rights. It, it, uh, these were the words of that judgment of 1958. Well, in any case, at that time, for sure you will remember the slogan of the French Re Revolution: "Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité." No, uh, well, this was more or less the idea. No? We are all equal, we are all free, we are all brothers <laughs> and sisters. <laughs> and so we have uh, the same right, we have uh, the same right to vote, to choose any kind of government that we want. As you, you know very well so many things of, of the French Revolution, how the kings passed away uh, and so many things. No? But we will see uh, some specific things for the purposes of this lesson. And first, we will read some articles of the French declarations of rights of the men and the citizen, remember the man and the citizen. It was so important uh, at that time. No? The rights are of the citizen, well, the man. The man, yes, but of the citizen. No? And the, in the first article, it says, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Yeah, more or less the same idea, very present in all the people, all the intellects of that time. Men are born and remain free and equal in rights. <laughs> Remember that, the, the slogan, no? Equality, fraternity, yeah, and also freedom. No? Social decisions can be founded only in the common good. Yeah, here is well, the problem, no? What it means, equality. Well, equality, a general and abstract equality of rights, but they realize that, well, 
we have to distinguish, no? So they realize that some distinctions should be approved. And the first line and the first article of the that declaration they quoted that. No? Second, the goal of any political association is the conservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, safety, and resistance against oppression. So this is quite interesting for our lecture. Two characteristic, two features of these rights. First one, the natural. What it means natural rights? And second, the imprescriptible rights of man. Well, uh, it is not so easy, these two words. We will see a lot of characteristics of human rights, but at that time, well, they are, they think that, well, all people around the world uh, have the same rights because we have the same nature, no? the same nature, based on nature, based on nature. The, the argumentation is not so clear, but in any case, they stated that. Let's see Article 3. The principle of any sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. Nobody, no individual may exercise any authority which does not proceed directly from the nation. Well, there is a lot of discussion in this constitution, in the next constitution, in the second constitution, in the third constitution, and so on. About, uh, well, who is the sovereign? There are many answers, no? Uh, here you can see the nation, the nation. At that time, it's so important, the concept of nation and citizen. And the rights are more or less based on, on the, on the and the quality and the condition of citizenship uh, uh, and the sovereignty of the nation. The next constitution will talk about the people. The people are the, the sovereign, not the nation, but the people. And then they will talk about the citizen, the French citizen. Citizens are the, uh, the ones who have the sovereignty. Well, this is a constitutional issue. You can develop that, but this it is, who is the sovereign? Who of these three options? Well, I just put the question now. Then in the next articles, uh, they develop a little more what is liberty, what is equality, especially these two concepts. No? And about liberty, in the article four, you can read, liberty consists of doing anything which does not harm others. Thus, the exercise of natural rights of each man has only those borders which assure other members of the society the fruition of the same rights. These borders can be determined only by the law. Well, uh, as you can see, it's not the greatest concept of liberty, of freedom that we gave in jurisprudence, no? The, the, there we saw so many concepts of, of freedom, no? I propose to you one of, for me, the, the deepest one, freedom as the, as the ability to choose or capacity to choose the good things for ourselves, you know? for our potency, for our life, for our projects. You know? uh, I think that it could be a deeper concept. In any case, they were thinking only not in the deepest concept of liberty, but in what it means liberty on the legal system, just on the legal system. And that's why they brought this. You know? uh, a very typical idea. You can find also some of this also in Kant, but in any case, uh, this it is not. It is not. 
my rights, I have all the rights that I can until there is a limit in the rights of the other, well, other members of the society, as you can read. It's a, 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 I insist, it's a legal concept of freedom, it's not the, the deepest concept of freedom of liberty. Or, and then a, a very famous article, Article 16. Any society in which the guarantee of rights is not assured, nor the separation of power determined, has no constitution. It's, well, it's one of the, the critical uh, ideas for the constitutionalist authors to understand what is a constitution. It's more than just a paper. It's more than yeah. A constitution means a little more, no? at least a separation of powers, and probably so many other things. No? Well, and uh, the last is about property, uh, but it it is in, very in, interesting to 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 read some words that at that time were understood as the principal or main characteristics of human you know, a, of human rights of the rights of the citizen no? it says property being an inviolable and sacred right inviolable and sacred two characteristics sacred imagine that sacred i don't know if you have heard about <laughs> any declaration that Today say no. This is a sacred human right. Well, at that time, it it was so possible to say no. no one can be the private or private of private usage. Now, well, if it is not for public necessity, legality, not etc. So this is very interesting. No? And some of these words, for example, this one. No? natural and imprescriptible rights of man at that time no? uh, well was was repeated uh, many times even in so many treaties on the history for example let's put some examples of these characteristics of human rights no? first Universal Declaration of Human Rights, approved in 1948. In the very first paragraph in the, of the preamble, it begins, whereas recognition of inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, peace, in the world well, so you can see that is you can read the, the word natural or not in this in this first paragraph of the universal declaration of human rights natural no there is no word no mention to natural right even though you can see so many, so many uh, similarities with the French Declaration, for example, uh, the Article One of the French Declaration talk about the that we are all equal and that is the foundation of all rights. And at the very beginning of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you can see also the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. So, why there is not the word natural? Well, because it was signed by many countries around the world. The draft, the draft, uh, of that declaration at the very beginning 
contain the word natural, natural rights also. No? But what happened? That at one point China appears. <laughs> and what happened with China? They didn't understood with the word natural the same thing that we understand. They think when they think about natural is something like well, environment, animals, plants, uh, so many things, trees, well, but not exactly the, the concept of nature that we have in our minds. Uh, developed along centuries with a great contribution of Aristotle and so many other philosophers. So uh, the, the people who, who brought the draft, the second draft, realized, and the third one, and, and so on, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, realized that they have to change the world. That's why no longer from this year until today, people used to talk about natural rights, but human rights. Okay, that, that is interesting. Other similarity, no? The equality was one, and the second, the foundation, the, well, the foundation is the, the, the more or less the dignity, is more, more clear in another paragraph of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Well, and you can read this, is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. No, this recognition of any other human rights. Let's see another covenant, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, uh, approved some years later, 1966. More or less is the same idea as you will see, no? Consider that in accordance with the principles proclaimed in the Charter of the United Nations, but which kind of principles were well, the Universal Declaration also, no? Uh, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is fun the foundation of freedom, justice, peace in the world. So, almost with the same words, uh, it says, no? Uh, the, all rights are inalienable and is based on equality, uh, are based on equality. The same year was approved a second covenant, no? international covenant on civil and political rights, and this time it used exactly the same words, exactly. Well, uh, probably there is, there is a little difference, but, but in this part, it's quite similar, no? And finally, we can see so many conventions today that probably use the same words, exactly the same words. International convention and regional, regional conventions that use the same words. For example, the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Uh, well, I can read again, but it's the same, exactly the same, no? The recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. Exactly the same. You can see that of this, well, natural is not so present, but the, the idea of that we have share something, and obviously, what, what we share? Nature, nature, if we are of the same species, yeah? That's why we, we share nature and we are equal and we have the same rights. Is the idea that the same idea is behind uh, of, of, of all the, these phrases, no? And in a negative right. So uh, now the new part of the code that we will see that is a synthesis of the of the list of human rights declaration, the natural law code, part two. We will see a lot of characteristics of the human rights, because 
what are the human rights, precisely that, no? The rights of the person, of the human person. And in the part two, uh, I have I have to send you the last version uh, now. By the way, you can have access now to the uh, to the e-learning platform, so you can subscribe yourself. I think that I have to share a key password, and I will do soon. But you you can enroll yourself as soon as you can because all the material you can find them very very easily well so in the limit number seven of the natural law code we can find uh, the same ideas and uh, uh, synthesis of the things that many constitutions and treaties and human rights declarations around the world say that are characteristic of human rights. No? So, here we can read here. No? The rights that directly and immediately derive from essential properties of the human being inherit the same characteristic of natural necessity and universality. This is the problem. This is the problem in these declarations, especially in any of these, no? Why, why are inalienable? Do you understand what is inalienable? The meaning of inalienable. Any one of you can explain me? Yes, Ali. That can never be taken away from you. Yeah, okay. And uh, what is the etymological meaning, don't you know? It's, it is more or less easy. What is an alien? What is an alien? A person. Something for it. Yeah. A person who came from the space, from another strange planet to invade us. Invade us. <laughs> well, obviously, it is more than that, no? But he is also an alien. <laughs> Uh, why? Because alien means other. It's from Latin. In Latin, any alien is any other, other people. So, inalienable means that cannot appertain to other people. My freedom, I cannot sell you. I cannot sell you my freedom. No. 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 And that's why, well, uh, but why why are universal? Why all the human rights are universal? This is the question. No? Well, we can see well because you we have the same nature. But what is the what is the link between nature and human rights? Nowadays you can see a, a proliferation, amazing proliferation and multiplication of human rights. No, every day we have more human rights to that. To this, to leisure, to play, to to rest, to 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 celebrate, <laughs> as you can see, you know. Uh, so, uh, which is the base? This is the the, the problem. No? Uh, I put the base, uh, as you can see, don't you? Uh, in the connection with the essential properties of the human being. We will see which kind of properties we have as human beings. But this probably is the foundation of the human rights. Yeah. Because the, all, for example, we have all the rights for the same property. Well, for, for the same property now, for property in general, in abstract, yes, but for the same computer, for the same book, for the same food, no, probably not. So it is not an universal. But well, th that is the question, no? how we can base that. And uh, let's see, in particular, natural rights are first, reasonableness, second, maintain an harmonious and indivisible unity among all. Uh, 
for a, a universal application, but the abstract notion of the universal right. Uh, so it is interesting to stop a little here. No? They maintain an harmonious and indivisible unity among all. You cannot divide. You cannot divide, no? You cannot say, well, I will be free the half part of my life, and the second I will be a slave, no? <laughs> because I want some money for my family and I will sell myself for to someone, no? No, it's, it's not possible. You cannot divide. This is more or less the idea of indivisible, indivisible. Uh, but, uh, and there is another, the people used to say that they are interdependent. And it's more or less the, the, the idea that, well, for example, if you don't have food, <laughs> you don't have the right to life. And if you don't have the right to life, you don't have food. There, so there is a strong connection between all the, the human rights. And, and it's true. It, it, probably there are more connections between a set of rights, for example, food, health, life, um, not so strong connections in uh, other other times, for example, uh, yeah, not, not, not that, but uh, rest, no, uh, probably, if I don't rest at, at all, I will die. <laughs> but well, to play, well, there are many people that never play. <laughs> and any, uh, to leisure, to vacation, well, it's not so well connected with uh, all human rights. But in any case, all of them uh, are like a system, a system, and if you touch one, you touch all in some sense. Um, now, now this this doctrine of the interdependence and the visibility of the human rights is very present in so many international courts of human rights, or commissions or entities of human rights. They 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 see all the human rights system as a system and uh, as an indivisible system or more or less like, as a little ecosystem they are prior to the superior to positive law and to any order constituted by human will obviously no you you can see uh, the well, it is clear that uh, the, some governments could not recognize the right to life or to freedom to to some people, no? but they have because we are equal. More or less. this is the idea in the French Revolution. And then this is part of the fact is quite important. Probably there will be a, a question in the quizzes about the, this this part. No? We, we, we are seeing now the characteristics, the features of the human rights. No? And, well, I don't know if you can read number five and tell me if you understand all the words. What is immutable? What is, yeah, I don't know, uh, imprescriptible, unconditional? More or less, or intangible. Do you understand? Understand all of these words? Yes, Ali. I understand. I'm pretty. Much. Anyone? Um, some. You you need some explanation. Which is intangible? For example, this one. Immaterial. No. 
in intangible uh, the etymological meaning is tangere is touch tangere in latin is touch intangible means that you cannot touch yeah you have to respect it's more or less the idea you cannot touch it's more or less is all of them are more or less related no non disposal you can it's, it's the same idea you cannot touch you cannot dispose uh, you ha you cannot uh, dispose is more specific no because you cannot uh, say you don't have this right and you have no yes uh, who, who raised your hand <laughs> any one of you and renunciable you cannot renounce it's more or less a, a, a consequence of non-disposal i cannot dispose even of my own rights no i cannot decide for example i want to be a slave i cannot decide that in any human right no? i will not have any longer privacy no yeah but it, it's incredible for some court there is an exception if you want to suicide yourself you can but for me it is not an exception it's it is a fact probably if you you want to suicide yourself but it, it is not a right it is not a right because all rights are uh, non-disposal and renounceable no are human rights no? inviolable you cannot violate any it's more or less the, the same idea no divisible you cannot divide i explained that no also here no in the second the indivisible unity more or less each one human right is also a uh, indivisible no? inalienable inalienable i explained that unconditional you cannot put conditions for example the law cannot say well you will have right to life uh, but you f should feel some form if not you are not a citizen and you will have not the right to life no the, the government cannot put any kind of conditions to recognize to protect uh, human rights and prescriptive can, with the pass of the time you cannot lose any right you know, in themselves obviously you no know? this is quite important uh, remember those words no uh, remember that, uh, not to not to make any confusion no? uh, for example in some quiz in other country one student of mine said me uh, well i asked now the, the characteristic of human rights and he put me viable imprescriptive in unimaginable, unbelievable rights, now incredible rights. <laughs> no, that's not a, a characteristic of rights. Well, Georgina, yes. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry, good, good afternoon. Um, yeah. I have a question. Okay. Um, when you say there, or maybe you're going to talk about this later, but when you say they're unconditional, un unconditional and the government can't put conditions on these rights um couldn't you say that the limitations are kind of condition yeah in some sense could be <laughs> yeah yeah i will go to your problem yeah uh, in some sense yeah and not also you can see all these words probably don't fit very well in so many times, no? For example, you cannot uh, renounce, no? Or it is uh, uh, inalienable, you cannot give to another your right, no? But what can happen, for example, with the right of image, of the, the physical image of each person? What happened with the actresses? For example, no? they used to sell pictures of themselves. No? <laughs> yeah, and it means that a part of your right you can give to another. No, uh, 
there is a limitation of the law also, no? and so many things. So there is a lot of questions about these kind of things. No? Are human rights properly uh, immutable? No, or, or you can discover little by little more time uh, rights or, uh, and change, even change. Uh, really, you can see in the, in the history of human rights, a little changes of approach to each human right, not to one, but to many, to many, no? And why they are mutable, no? Not uh, move, change, no? And prescriptive, well, there is a lot of questions, it's not so easy. At that time, in the French Revolution, there were not, no questions at all with this, no? Because we, have, we share the same nature, it will be the same uh, characteristics. I will say, I will say that we have to read once again the first paragraph of the code, <laughs> of the limit seven. The rights that directly and immediately derive from the essential properties will have all these characteristics. Not all of them, not the consequences of the, the rights. One thing is the right to freedom, because we have the will, and, and, and uh, it, it is a freedom is a property of the human and, uh, being, and as such, the right to freedom you cannot give to anyone. But probably you can sign a work agreement and to say to your boss, "I will be in the office." from seven to three o'clock, for example, no? And I will work with you. Well, you are giving part of your freedom. <laughs> uh, obviously, you are giving freely part of your freedom, but you are giving part of your freedom, of your time, of your energies, of your rest. You, will, you cannot rest at that time, no? So, but as such, in abstract, uh, what well, the right it cannot be sell for freedom, but some consequences, some some specifications of time can be uh, given to another people. Well, this is my, my more or less my understanding. And finally, they are called to be specified, and this is the the con uh, the consequence of the things that I said in each place and develop it over time. Develop because the, uh, the right as such uh, is just a potential right with a lot of possibilities. You know? And on the time over the centuries, we, we, we are seeing you know, that there are many specifications of the cultural rights, for example, and of so many other rights. Yes, Ali. So, due to the analysis of the characteristics of these rights, must these rights be um, documented to raise sovereign consciousness that they are natural rights and they have these specific characteristics? Yeah, 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 I think that, that you're right. Uh, yeah, In, as far as they are connected with the nature, they will have the same characteristic of the nature. We have the same nature from, well, from when we are Homo sapiens sapiens. <laughs> All the Homo sapiens sapiens as we are, have, uh, share the same nature and the things that we can uh, put as a conclusion directly of understanding that nature will have the same characteristic of the nature. That is to say, universality yeah, and all these kind of things, immutable as far as the nature not change, yeah, it means. No? There's another question, there's another question about the hierarchy, hierarchy of the human rights. All of them have the same hierarchy? Well, some courts say no, all of them have not the same, most of them, the courts nowadays say, all of them have the same hierarchy. Um, well, it is for me incredible because it seems to be that it's not the same 
in some aspect the hierarchy of the right to rest and the hierarchy of not to be tortured um, the right to life it's quite different seems to me in some sense one of them should be higher than all when the treaties well there are two treaties around the world that said that all rights have the same hierarchy uh, and the constitutions some constitutions say the same one example of is the one of my country Ecuador uh, say that probably they are talking about the formal hierarchy obviously if all more or less is to say more or less is the same to say that all the rights that are stated in a treaty or in a declaration or in a constitution have the same level in the legal system of that country of the constitution of the treaty of the declaration is that tautology as you can see you know it's just a formal hierarchy but there could be many other kinds of hierarchies for example no the, the what is first no the right of life or the right of health yeah first you have to be alive <laughs> to be able to have some health no it's quite connected but chronologically you have to first to have life and then that and with both you can be uh, exercise your freedom the freedom is a third in the chronological uh, process yeah uh, otieno yes you have your hand raised. Oh yes. Um, I was thinking when you when you say uh, there's this hierarchy in the um, in the human rights. I, I think that when you put a hierarchy on such things like uh, the ones that um, lie in the lower in the lower part, like it shouldn't be taken seriously. So I I think I understand why the judges are saying that they should be treated equally since they're interdependent and also the effect of the inferior rates uh, to the others, which they do superior. Yeah, yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, but judges, <laughs> uh, even uh, they quote the same phrases in those countries and uh, in, in that treaty that I told you, even if they uh, quote the same words they use to be, realize that rights are have not the same level and the same they say the the, the technical word is the same weight <laughs> and you can see you can see uh, that when they applied the balance test the weight test to see which right should prevail they they measure no who is who is more more in, intense more more deep more, have more weight no, the right to expression to information or the right to privacy if there is a collision well we have to see in each case which one will have so it means that they 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 realize that all of the, the rights have not the same level in some sense. You can read this this limit. It's precisely the next one, uh, the limit number number eight in the code. Okay. So nowadays, nowadays, what is a human right? A human right. The classical classical definition is the one that you have in the main book that we will read in this lecture in well in this course of human rights that is the handbook for parliament parliamentary uh, people and you can read this in that book human rights uh, let me put something here yeah okay Human rights are inherent to all human beings. They define relationships between individuals and power structures, especially the state. Well, this is a, a, a specific approach of human rights. It's not the 
the things that all people understood in America, for example, or uh, in the French Revolution even, you know, are rights against the state. Human rights, the, the limit, state power, and at the same time, it requires the state to take positive measures, ensuring an environment that enables all people to endure the human rights. So, history in, uh, history in the past 250 years has been shaped by the struggle to create such environment, starting with the French and American Revolution in the late 18th century. Well, um, first idea, uh, an inherent of all human beings, no? And second idea, our power, uh, our rights against the power structure, against the state. But it means quite different visions. I don't know if you realize that, no. This is the first approach, and this is well, the, the, the second approach in each, each way. So, the first approach is more rational. It's a rational approach. It's an abstract approach. I mean, when, with the, when you are talking in an abstract way, probably you can say, well, all rights are inviolable, uh, imprescriptible, inalienable, uh, not un unbelievable <laughs> rights. <laughs> no, uh, but the, all the, the characteristics that we have read, you can apply to in this approach. Pro pro no? And then there are other more positivistic approach that started with the French and American Revolution. And in each revolution, the rights were so different, understood. First, we have the American Revolution. Remember the American Revolution, no? They, they conquered uh, the independence, independence, and from the very beginning, they have no, no, a powerful structure except uh, them that oppress no, them in some sense. No? So they realize we are free. In America, we are free. We have no king. We can choose our destiny or fate or future with uh, our will, with our freedom. No? So this is a, a very interesting approach. Uh, and, is, and that's why the, the concept of natural rights of John Locke was so, so clearly adopted by the Americans. No? But on the other hand, we have the French Revolution. In the French Revolution, the rights were so different, so different. They were more or less like, like a Trump, you know? uh, a, 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 a battle in which the commoners and the people of French conquer one right from the hands of the king. We, we have seen also that in the, the British law, no? so many Carta Magnas, no? and so many Bill of Rights, and habeas Corpus Right Act, uh, and so many acts that the, it's a, a kind of battle against the, the state powers, the king, to obtain the recognition of one right. No? So this second point of view of the French people and, and probably of most of Europe, and, uh, the continental approach of the rights, of human rights, and fundamental rights are more the, as, as a public liberty. This right have so many, so many, uh, the first name that we use is the human, right, the natural rights, no? as you have seen. No? But then, uh, obviously, human rights. And you hear they are seen more, more or less like the French Revolution. Uh, 
uh, conquer uh, from the state powers a public subjective right public because it's, uh, it's against the, the state no? or another name a public liberty it is also so useful no? a public liberty any right is a public liberty it's a right to confront the state no? fundamental rights are also used obviously and also individual guarantees no? there's more or less i think that the state give to you more or less like the theory of hobbes of the leviathan a monster that will give you the, your rights <laughs> you will reckon well more or less is is for some people this um, probably in the french revolution is behind the ideas also this no? now with the second well the defenders by, uh, of the human rights you will see that the defenders of the human rights probably most of them thinks in the rational way not in the thing that you can write or, uh, and the detract detractors we have seen that we will just add some little things and let's begin with the defenders I'm sure you you will remember this this uh, both of them Aristotle with the book the ethics um, Plato pointing heaven uh, well uh, I'm repeating now exactly the same thing now that he, uh, Aristotle said what well, there is a natural law for every one and that is what is that law what is practical reason no law is an art no and we see that if we want to survive as a society well, we have to protect uh, so many rights more or less this is the 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 aristotelian approach uh, aquinas aquinas also say well there is a natural law uh, designed by by god but we can know with our knowledge with our intelligence what is it's about uh, because it's the red justia the quality and the quality is forever <laughs> uh, one plus one will be two in any circumstances in the world in the in the centuries in any any culture any people so so if the reason the same reasons uh, you can apply in too many circumstances now obviously if the circumstances change the reasons change yeah but you can apply the same reasons to the same circumstances no? it's the eternal law designed by the law part of the eternal law is the natural law that have a rights and morality and that one part of the natural law have only rights now is more or less in conclusion and determination we have seen that now but all natural rights are based in this now at the end of the day is the same argument of aristotle in the reason in the practical reason we have to survive we, what authorities are for also protect the people in the rights of the people to encourage uh, them to do good things to make happiness possible for example no? And Victoria, Victoria, we have seen that he was in trouble with the explanation of the the Indians of Latin America were person. No? I mean, if we have to protect them and they have rights, and he said obviously they have rights; they are equal to us. In his great book. Relexio the Indies, no, they have the same natural rights as us. He he told at that time, five centuries ago, of natural rights. All people at that time, uh, from Aristotle, told uh, uh, talked about natural rights. Well, uh, Aristotle with another language because it was old Greek and it's so different than old Greek. But in any case, no, we can say that. All these authors used to base human, the rights, the natural rights of people, on human dignity. You know? We have all the same dignity, and more or less is the same approach of the human of French Revolution you know? that supports individuals' rights. 
this uh, Vittoria, how, however, uh, nevertheless is is so deep, is so deep because he realized that there is also some uh, communi community approach. No, it's just not the individual rights. There could be some rights of the community also. It's so deep. We have seen also John Finney, no, that is fo follow the Aristotle Aquinas, and he talked about also practical reason, no? that res requires respect for every basic value in every act. Um, for sure we remember the basic goods, no? basic goods that support all the legal system, our life, knowledge, place, ethics, sociability, practical reasonableness, and religion. But here we cannot align that basic goods are related to basic and self-evident needs, no? the needs of the, each human person. And that's why he said, no, the needs more or less support human rights, no? the basic goods, the, the basic things. He, he makes, made some, a lot of considerations of, of self-evident needs, inclination of human being. And the conclusion was that there were seven basic goods, no more is less is this, no? So this is a great theory that many people used to follow, no? How to underpin human rights? Well, on the basic needs of the people. If you need this to survive as a human, well, this is a right for you. It's one of the usual foundations of human work. No? Human rights, oh, he said, is nowadays is exactly the same as natural rights. But Britain, no? uh, put in, put it in, in, in a document, a positive natural right, he said. No? Finish. So I don't know if you, some of you, could, uh, could say me. Can say me who is that guy? Well, don't, don't worry because it's not so easy. It's not so easy. It's Jack Maritime. Jack Maritime is a philosopher of the last century. Probably the most famous or one of the most famous French philosophers, and was so famous, especially in the field of human rights, because he was on a one of the drafters of the human universal declaration of human rights so the thing that he say about human rights in human rights theory are very well considered no? so he, he 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 said for example that when he was writing the Human rights, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, with a lot of people from China, from uh, Africa, from uh, South America, from many places around the world. He wanted, really wanted, to put the name of natural rights inside into the into the Universal Declaration of hum, Human Rights, but he found a problem, a terminological problem, a, a problem of the language. Because in Chinese, natural doesn't mean the same that in French or in Latin or, or in English. No. Natural is more or less like uh, the environment, but just that, no? The, the, well, the mountains, the, the river, uh, the trees, and uh, these kind of things. But it's, it's not the mean of the nature, the deepest notion of nature that we have uh, from Aristotle. Yeah, because it's a very rich concept in in our culture, uh, culture. So that's why that's why uh, they decided to use another another words, no, uh, uh, human rights, human rights, uh, no, not natural rights, uh, because Chinese people didn't understand very well what it means. So finally, they didn't use natural rights. This is a very interesting uh, 
you know, a, a comment of this guy, no? one of the drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He's a personalist philosopher and put a lot of difference between, uh, you, you know, will not, uh, things are personal. No? What is the distinction? He, he have, uh, uh, has a book about this distinction. What, uh, what is the distinction in the field of the law? The field of the law. No? Human rights are based on natural law. Yeah, once again, underpinned on person dignity. Dignity, dignity justify human rights. This is another guy. Huh? For sure, you will remember Thomas Hobbes. Oh, no. Wrote Leviathan many centuries ago, and it is not wisdom but authority that makes a law. How he justifies the, the rights of the people? Well, in that monster, no? the authority with all the power. If the authority with all the power has, uh, that power is to ensure the rights of the people, to, to protect, to give some security, some peace to the world. You know? and, well, it's a positive foundation of all the rights, of any right, also a human right will be. Uh, so, finally, we have seen also this guy, no? John Rawls. John Rawls here teaches to accept inequalities even if they secure maximum welfare. And the question of justice is uh, previous to the question of happiness for, for him, no? Uh, what is right as prior to what is good. Justice is for just fairness. And then, well, we will see, uh, you, you will remember the, the doctrine of the veil of ignorance. So, finally, we, we can see you now that human rights for him are based in dialogue, you know, in dialogue between all the, the people of the, our community. You know? And an individual autonomy, also. No? Uh, well, we can uh, talk together and decide which kind of rights we will protect because we have autonomy, each one. No? More or less, is uh, one, the, the, the basis of the social contract. No? That you will see. I, I'm repeating. In this part, as you see, the last lecture of jurisprudence. This part, but having some some lines about human rights. Much better say that human rights, or fundamental rights, are also described as a sociological pattern of rule setting. David Hume, before uh, better uh, said that human rights codify moral behavior. Our behavior, which is a human social product developed by a process of biological and social evolution. And we can see that there is an evolution on human rights. It is clear, it's quite clear. Uh, so, who of them have the reason which could be the base of human rights? Once again, the, the, the the same question of the last lecture of, of well, we, 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 as a synthesis, no? There are some theories that base all human rights on the necessities, on the human necessity, the basic one. One. Uh, another, uh, other authors say that human rights are based on dignity. Probably, you told me that uh, at the very beginning of this lecture, no? No, the dignity is the base because all of us have the same dignity. And it's the French approach of the French Revolution, no? more or less. And it's the first uh, paragraph of many, many declarations of human rights. Uh, so, human dignity could be. Uh, and some other axiological theories, no? Uh, the, actually, remember. Dignity is a, a kind of value, no? so deep, so so not mentionable that we can not call value, but 
dignity. It's a phrase of Spenner. Well, axiological theories. Well, the ideological nature or the dialogue of, it, of all the members of the society, of all the nations, you realize the, how was approved uh, the hum, Universal Declaration of Human Rights with a dialogue no? between nations after seeing so many problems in the countries. No? So it's a product of dialogue. It is right or not. Or based on individual autonomy, autonomy, more or less roles, Dorkin, you know, the autonomy of each one, or, um, or mix at this with the, the ideological human nature. No? Or could be also Hobbes, no? based just on the authority, no? the positive foundation, no? the positive foundation. Or finally, you can see, no, it is just, it is just a, uh, an historical product, no? uh, sociological patterns, uh, uh, behavior of the people. Georgina, yes. <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> sorry again. I wanted to ask, among the people who we've just discussed, <clears throat> among the people who we've just discussed, who brings out the axiological theories? Well, there are many. This is a synthesis, uh, but uh, 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 part of the axiological theories is the human dignity. Uh, you can justify this in human dignity because human dignity is a value and it's part of axiology. But also you can justify it in, in freedom, in the peace, in security, in property. All of them are also values. Yeah, we have seen also in the French Revolution declaration and in many others that they talk about freedom, peace, liberty, uh, property, and some these things especially. So you can find there also some axiological uh, basis. Okay. Yes. Okay. Which. Which one of them, uh, of that theory, do you can agree? I don't know, for you, for any one of you, which one justified the human rights? Justified. What do you think? Which one convinced you more. Tasneem, yes. Um, I think I would say that Ma Marita, um, he makes a convincing argument because he addresses two core foundations, which are natural law and human dignity, mm -hmm. while some other authors um, focus quite a lot on human dignity, autonomy, so Marita like combines the two. So I think he convinces me because he has a cohesive understanding um, of human rights that is also very modern. Very good. And um, for Collins, for example, what do you think about which one you prefer? Um, I think I agree with Tasneem. Marita has uh, really convinced me, but um looking at i mean coming from jurisprudence now we're here i think i would just synthesize all of those uh to say that it also depends on um which level you are looking at them uh from yeah then with that you can you can form an opinion yeah that is what i'm talking about the, exactly very good <laughs> well you, know, you, can think. Level, you are looking at them uh then you can be able to for example you have to view them in totality yeah but if we're talking about a single author then i think it's maritan yeah. yeah i think that all of them see some basis some real basis yeah the human necessities well oh, this is a strong argument if i need water <laughs> you have to think first how to how you can give because 
Why? Because any human have dignity and we should protect any human and principally the necessities of each one. How you can protect if you don't take care of your, their necessities? Well, you have to take care. This is also a basis. But this is the basis of the reality, no? You can say no. And the, and the knowledge, no. In a dialogue, we can discover we can discover the, the, the reasons, the deepest reasons of the how we had to protect all that values, no? But it's not just the value of dignity, it's also uh, property, security, peace, and so many others. No? It's just not one value. Uh, and how to protect? We, well, uh, we uh, talking with, together, we can discover. No? And with the autonomy of each one, we can approve some declarations to protect them. No? In, in, with a positive instrument. Nowadays, human rights be, uh, become very positivistic right. Yeah, very positivistic. If it is not brought uh, in, in some document, well, more or less. Uh, well, nowadays, uh, in the last part of uh, the 20th century, but in the last 20 years, they realized that we have to develop more, no? with a lot of theories, we will see that in this course. No? And finally, also the sociological pattern have brought, no? it's just, it's just, they just see the, the being, no? the, the circumstances, the, the, the human rights, uh, the living uh, human rights. No? Uh, yeah. So I agree with Collins, absolutely. <laughs> so let's take care of about the, the doctors. No? Now, uh, this is one of the directors in my book. He said, well, uh, he, he studied so much history and he said that constitutional legitimacy was derived not from the rational doctrine of general will, but from a form of inherited wisdom. This guy who was in the French Revolution realized that the declaration of the rights of the man and the citizen uh, have no past. And there were, there was no tradition of those rights. So that was the, the critique. No, well, uh, it's, you have to test the right with time. I think that probably well, uh, is well to have some tradition, but more or less you can improve a lot. No. And on the other hand, you have a lot of theory and a lot of of experience, principally of so many rights in the in the UK, the Habeas Corpus Act, for example, and, and so many other rights there. So some tradition could exist not in France but in other parts of the world. This uh, it was another critique of them. From the, the critique is again things, no. Uh, the natural law, that for him is just a speculation, and the common law, the set of case law that are just a private opinion in disguise, as you will remember now. The mere opinion, mere opinion of men self-constituted into legislators. Well, it is incredible because he, he was a qualification, no? Say it, no, it's good a qualification. Yeah, it was against the declaration of the rights of man and of the citizen, but uh, in favor of the qualification. Well, uh, he said they lack meaning, they lack meaning, the, those rights. No, uh, what is liberty? It's so ethereal, so abstract, so general. No. So we have to be more uh, specific in this uh, when we approach something. No? Uh, well, there are many things that we have seen in the and Marx also. You will remember the critique, but the critique for what? For the well, for, for the capital system, uh, specifically for the rights. But he connects. No, who approved that? Well, the capital uh, capitalist, uh, the bourgeoisie, no. So all the things that 
they did are wrong. <laughs> so that was uh, another thing. But also he said, no, all the law is a super structure, not based on the people. No? So he was against the all kind of law. So it is so hard to 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 speak with that theory. And if you don't think that there should be any kind of law. Or, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, well, he realized that uh, workers workers have to be protected, and more or less this is an idea that you have to put some kind of right. We will see Marx again in the next lectures of, of human rights. We are just remembering now, also a rarity that he said, that rights are emotions, sentiments, feelings, no? Mm -hmm. And we can say, obviously, are, are uh, sentiments, but they are more than feelings. No? <laughs> uh, Mahatma Gandhi, the, he was against because they, he didn't discover their the duties, the duties that we have to our common brothers. No, listen, those are the critics. And now I want to pass to another, to, to the notion of Jews cogens. To the notion of Jews cogens, probably the last part, uh, we will see very fast. Have you heard about Jews cogens? It's quite related with human rights, specific with the most important human rights. For example, in another subject like international law. Have you heard about that? Don't you, ha don't you have any kind of notion of what could be Jews cogens? Yes. Play. Well, or Bernice, I don't know what happened with your micro. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, just a trial. I think it's a um, compelling law. A compelling law. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, probably could be, a, in some sense, a compelling law. It's first, it's not just gentium. Just gentium is a notion developed centuries ago in, in Rome also, no? This the, was the, the law for the Roman citizen on the, uh, on the people in the empire and the law for all people that are not in the empire, no? that are outside foreigners and so many. The, the law of all people. No? What is uh, the use gentium, the antique concept? No, is but this in use in almost all towns. This is a notion, a, a typical notion of Saint Isidore of Seville. This is, but now uh, more or less is is now with this notion of use gentium and use cogens of that time was developed the the, the idea of use cogens. As a thing that will will uh, be enforced in any place, in any place around the world, with any people, it's not. It doesn't matter if it is a, a citizen or not. It doesn't matter if if, if you are here or you are uh, outside uh, or you are abroad. Well, is. Uh, and that's why it's a parental norm. Uh, you have to fulfill that. Now, what is a parental norm? Well, we will see. Ali, yes, you have you raised your hand. Um, I have I have just a clarification on um use cogens. Would you say that there are universal laws that they apply to each and every individual? To every people, yes, we can say that. Uh, well, uh, if they, every people fulfill the conditions, obviously, 
of the, that case. We will see the cases, no? You will see the cases. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. So it's a parent turning now. It's a parent turning now. So one a very important treaty in the history of treaties, the treaty of the treaties, <laughs> is the treaty that explains how to sign a treaty, how to subscribe one, how to 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 declare null and so many things. This is the binding convention of the law of treaties signed in 1969. And there is one article, article number 53, in which you can read this phrase. A treaty is void if at the same time of its conclusion, it conflicts with apparent norms of general international law. So, uh, in a, in a, it clause is this article. You can apply to any treaty around the world, also to the human rights treaties. And what it says, well, there, that there are some some general norms that are parentary that you cannot. Uh, uh, you have to to see to to fulfill to obey always, no. If some treaty is against the, that provision, it uh, will be declared void. It's void. It's null. It will not work. Uh, so, more or less, this is the positive base of the uh, use cogens, of the parentary norms. So, let's. Uh, is that just naturally? We can say. Is quite related with the the idea of uh, use necessarium, no? uh, necessary law that is part of natural law. But let's see some examples, uh, examples of, of the things that we are seeing. Some examples uh, that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights put. Why I use this and not the European and not the, 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 the other that is here in Africa? No? Because some other courts don't want to talk about use cogens. Probably they are talking about the same things. The European Court of Human Rights probably most of the times say, say the same conclusion. No? In this case, you cannot be always should be respected. Uh, torture is not uh, allowed anywhere, any, anyhow, any, in any place. No, it is a strong prohibition, and we, you will never be able to torture anyone. So, but he, the, the European Court never talked about just cogens. Instead of that, the Inter-American Court always talk about always talk about uh, use cogen and say no this is part of use cogen and these two and these two and these two and you cannot uh, 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 say anything ag against that what kind of pro prohibitions you find in use cogen the pro prohibition of crimes against humanity first no crimes against humanity for example, genocide, mass internal displacement, and mass disappearances. That are examples of this jurisprudence of this court, international court. No? The right to life is part of use cogens, they say. No? The use of force is the prohibition is part of use cogens. No? The prohibition of torture, cruel, and inhuman or degrading, uh, degrading treatment. The principle of equality before the law, equality protection before the law, and non-discrimination. No? The right to state self-determination is also part of use code. Use code, obviously. Uh, so many other rights now. 
the prohibition of the of obstruction of to access to justice is part of it. Huh? So, uh, well, a forced disappearance also and many other things. So, would you mind repeating forced disappearance? Uh, yeah, but I, I saw that there is a problem here. But this, there, there are just examples, I see, because it's automatically, that I will do this, but it will, will disappear automatically. It is just examples you have in the optional reading, these kind of things, and some in the compulsory readings, also some example of this. Do you agree with that? That these are, Parentary norms that always would be should be recognized these rights or prohibit some crimes that are stated here or not. Yes, Adi. I I definitely agree with both of them because when talking about preemptory norms or use codes. There are prohibitions that will apply each and every country, regardless of the national law that exists. So yeah. the point where we there is the use of force to cruel, which applies everywhere, regardless of the existing. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And it is more or less the same idea of the French Revolution that there are some rights that are inalienable that cannot appertain to another, that you can re not renounce and, and are, are universal. Uh, more or less is the same idea. And as you can see, so many rights of the, of the rights, uh, human rights are part of the Euskogians, if not all. Or so, uh, but uh, there is the problem. No? The problem is one case that well, that used to put one example that, uh, well, about torture. What is torture? Uh, there is a convention against torture. The convention say, say this, no? Any act which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for such purposes as obtaining from here or a third person information or a confession, punishing him for an act he or a third person committed or is suspected of having committed, or intimidating or coercing him or a third person or for any reason based on discriminatory of any kind when such pain or suffering is inflicted by or at the investigation of or with the consent of requirements of a public official or other person <laughs> acting in an official capacity. Well, <laughs> so you need an official capacity or acting in, or well, so many things, no? But remember these two words, huh? an act, a well, severe pain or suffering, and whether physical or mental, no? more or less this, you know, well, this is more or less the, the idea, and there are so many judgments around the world that say that it is part of just cogens and it's a parent or none, and you never will be able to change that. And if you do one of things of this, you are incurring in, in a crime against humanity. Uh, well, so this is an example no? of the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, and Degrading Treatment and Punishment. There is a guy that talked about this, and he said, the Luman case, I don't know if you have heard about this case. It's an hypocritical case. No? We have seen uh, Niklas Luman in, in jurisprudence, who, who is that guy? And in 1992, he, he 
So in this case, uh, a suspected terrorist in a custody whom the authorities are certain, remember this, the authorities are certain that uh, this guy has some information, has the necessary information to prevent an impeding attack of a ticking bomb which will claim the lives of many people soon. How much time we have? 14 minutes. No, no. This individual is unwilling to talk, but the authorities believe or are certain, you have the, the two possibilities, that the information can be extracted under torture. Well, the question now is, what you will do if you are the authority? You will ask to your officers, please torture him because we have to save the city or not. You, you have, have read, no? The, the, what is torture? What do you think in this case? Is, you will apply some, some torture some suffering, some pains to that individual to obtain them and to save the city? Yes, Ali. Um, I think it's two part analysis. So um, in, the, in, the, in the utilitarian um, analysis then, we would use torture to save more people in saving lives instead of the ticking bomb essentially killing all those individuals who are within a building. And secondly, if at all we are not going to use torture, then ultimately those individuals will die and the terrorists will still be alive, which it, even though it protects that definition, it legitimizes officials to kill him. Yeah, but which one is your answer? You are the authority. You 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 can ask to end anything, anyone. But but you will torture or not? Under authority, yes, to be legitimate. And you will, and is, it is not a parental norm that cannot that uh, be cannot have any kind of exception. What do you think? I don't know, Kelvin. Or Otieno, or Faith. Time is passing. Once again, is it legitimate to torture the individual or not? To save the city? Uh, can I answer? Yeah. Oh, um, uh, to apply the balance weight test, I'd balance the, the rights at stake. So I'd torture the prisoner because there are many lives um, at stake right now. And it's uh, over, over the right of one prisoner. So I'd um, interfere with the right of the prisoner from torture so that I can save the other people in that town. Yeah. Well, this is not a um, so hypothetical case. For example, in Chile, uh, the defense of Pinochet was exactly that. Well, if I don't do that, if I don't do, uh, we were in, in a war and we have to defend ourselves from the, and that's why the president used the force to stop the people the, he said, well, in the next state, if I don't use the, the force, uh, I will be died. Mm -hmm. uh, guy, yes. Here. Um, so in, in this case, I would actually torture the individual because of the risk that failing to do so would, in, uh, would cause to all other rights. So yes, the rights 
the right to life of other people is going to be interfered with but more than than just that if i fail to to avert this danger if i fail to stop this terrorist from committing this act then it's going to create a mentality that anyone else in the city can set a ticking time bomb and refuse to give the information on the grounds that they will not be tortured and at the end of the day they will still be able to achieve the goal of you know killing many people yeah. so that that would be the reasoning why i would torture the individual well so but just a few minutes ago all of you said me i agree with the that it is a parental norm and we cannot pass over that norm so what happened now so do you believe that as nicolas luman said that there is no parental norm at all in any place in any treaty in any human rights declaration What do you think? Now you agree with Luman and not with the French Revolution. All of you will torture or anyone will not torture that guy. <laughs> yes. Georgina, now you and then Um, I have a question. <laughs> okay. Time is passing. <laughs> so many people will die. Do I, have, do I have enough time to evacuate the area? Okay. Which is your question? Which one? Yes. Do I have Do I have enough time to evacuate the area? Yes. Is that do can i evacuate the area maybe as an authority that's what i would ask myself before considering torture uh, if you can do sorry can you repeat me that uh, before um, considering torture to evacuate the area that has the bomb well but you don't know where is the bomb oh okay okay That's why they are trying to 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 obtain that information. Ali, yes. For me, torture is one um, peremptory norm. But even secondly, the right to life is another peremptory norm. So at a point, you're seeking to protect the right to life of all the other individuals who are about to die, and we balance the right to life of all those individuals at the expense of one individual. Who essentially is a suspected terrorist with that information to prevent that attack of a ticking bomb. We shall torture that individual to protect his right to life and the other individual's right to life, which for me, I think is the first peremptory norm among the other peremptory norms that exist within the list. Yeah, well, uh, it's more or less a, a balance, a mix of utilitarian <laughs> approach saying, well, how many will die and how many will survive? Uh, well, in any case, I, I, I think that we have to save the life of all the people. Yeah. And, uh, so, what I will do? What I will do? Uh, Otieno, you, do you want to say something else? Uh, I wanted to say that uh, peremptory norms are, are okay and they are good uh, to apply, but um, I think depending on a case-to-case -case basis, um, they can be done away with uh, as a special, depending on the special circumstances. And I think this case is a, a very special circumstance for the pre peremptory norm to be lifted, but it should be special, yeah. Yeah, okay. You will torture. Yes. <laughs> Bernice, yes. Um, I have a question. A question. Are there like, yeah, are there like uh, special situations where the lack of compliance with the peremptory norm can be ex exempted, rather? Like no, that's that's the mean of peremptory norm. That's the mean of peremptory norm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, play. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now yes. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, how about failure to act? I mean, because if you keep him there and you technically do nothing to him and there's a bomb, he is also at peril. So technically you've not tortured him, but he'll be coerced to telling you where the bomb is, unless of course he has no sense of self-preservation. Well, okay. Uh, well, final word for Kerr. Okay. Um, so for me, basically, if the authorities are certain that he's going to talk, then I might as well. Yeah, okay. so if, he, if we know he's going to talk, if we torture him, then by all means, I'm going to torture him. Yeah, okay, well. Okay, as you can see, there are many problems. Is I will try to give my answer connected with the thing that we have said and you have said, uh, and to. But uh, I will see uh, what I probably I will do. I don't know. Probably I will never do a strong torture. One thing because there are levels. No? Remember uh, uh, the, the definition of the of the convention. No, it's a mental or physical, not just physical. No? I will never apply, for example, to good any, any finger, no? or, or, or to smash, I don't know, any part of the world, <laughs> the, the body. Uh, but probably I will say, well, uh, I will put your, all your family uh, there, um, well, some, something, obviously some verbal, verbal, Pressure, I will put uh, undoubtedly. Uh, that's, but it's a kind of torture. Yes, it's a kind of torture with the definition we, that we just have read now. Uh, probably, I don't know. Because uh, abs uh, a hundred percent certainty is so difficult to have now that he knows the, the information. Uh, and if with torture we will have the information or not. And probably I think that we here have to apply it, not that phrase. You have to apply epikeia. For sure you remember what it, it is. <laughs> yeah, it's an exception because the legislator never thought about this case. So strange is this case. Probably so difficult that happened, no? So you have to apply epikeia. And what you have to apply instead of that, probably the doctrine of a legitimate defense. This doctrine we will see in this course of human rights, the requirements are five or six requirements to apply the legitimate defense. And if you fulfill that, you will be able to, to stop that. If not, well, it is not possible. So let's put the last. Uh, just to see what happens if you don't obtain the information. No? But in any case, uh, <laughs> <this> <laughs> yes. uh, in any case, what I want to show you with this first, that, that the problem of the words of the of the that you use that all rights are universal are uh, inviolable and prescriptible and, and divisible and so many other things all that characteristics you cannot apply all those words to any phrase that is written in any declaration of human rights because all things that the human uh, mind produce are uh, imperfect, are not, not uh, have some problems. And this, this definition have some problems. Is, is the ones who brought that, uh, he said, no. Whether physical or mental, well, it's not the same, the, the, 
the physical suffering and the mental suffering. Yeah, and we, we can say that sometimes could be higher. Yeah, yeah. But, but one thing is the, the torture of the body, and one thing is the torture of the mind. Uh, well, and, the, the, and there are so many uh, great you know, levels of torture. So, so uh, that's why uh, eight, eight characteristics of the human rights fits very well in the rational approach. When we rationally discover that in this specific case, you have a right, well, in this specific case with all the circumstances of this, well, if the, you can see the same case with the same circumstances, you should apply the same reason. And that's why it is, uh, this right is universal. No? But it, these characteristics don't work very well, as Nicholas Luhmann say, uh, if we just uh, and all, also Bentham, uh, he's uh, no a mere abstraction, a mere abstraction. And also Burke, no, he said, well, uh, there is no tradition. Uh, remember the, the critique of Burke. He, there is no tradition. How will he, we will apply that? We, we have to choose one kind of cases and to see yeah, this case we, we can apply. And if it, the same case repeat, well, we will apply the same. So I, I really agree with all the detractors of human rights, in some sense, in some sense, in some sense, because they are written in so generically, so in an abstract way, and you have to see when you apply. And it's just in these cases you will see well there is. The, the whole characteristic as indivisible in and in the well, and so many things you can apply it. if not it would be so difficult well and this now uh, let's see uh, some theories about discogens one is discogen induced naturally another is in the public order theory you know there is uh, uh, public order, uh, specific order that you have in L each legal system to protect. No? So normative status should be derived of, of use cogens. Normative status reduced con should be derived through the reference to the common values of the international community, in the legal system of the international community, and the domestic legal orders. And, um, Customary laws, and customary law, yeah, the international customary law. Yeah. Uh, they say, well, uh, there are so many customs uh, in, that you can see in jurisprudence, in, in many treaties, in many many acts of the of the official bodies of the countries. Well, in these in these acts, statutes, laws, in this custom, we can find what is really a, a, a peremptory norm, uh, use cogens, no? Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, well, the conclusion, I, I gave my conclusion. I, well, I, I, I just sorry that I would put just a little pressure. Uh, well, and finally, there is another theory that grants the notion of use coins, that most of the natural rights could be founded there, or some of them, obviously. And they, they, they say the last uh, approach is that they are self-evident uh, rights or prohibitions or law at, at the end of the day. No? So I don't know. In you, you, what do you think about this? Uh, for me, use cogens is a, a construction of, of the well, it's a construction developed uh, of the human by, my, mind. Uh, but let's see, let's see how the courts apply uh, human uh, use cogens because it's, it's so difficult when we talk uh, natural law, natural law, use naturally. Well, what kind of natural law? At the end of the day, is is uh, something that is rational and have some reasons to say you no. Know, 
uh, and in more or less the same, the public order or the customary law uh, based on some treaties. For see how it is applied, we have another case. This is our real case, the case of Dominguez versus United States. What happened in Dominguez? He was condemned to death. In, in I think that, let me remember, uh, in, uh, in the 90s, well, yeah, uh, he was a young guy of 16 years old, uh, Michael Dominguez. He lived in Nevada, the United States, and committed two murders two murders <laughs> in the high school, imagine that, no? that's why the, the uh, Supreme Court of the, what well, he appealed, he was condemned to, to death at 16 years old, no? And there was a, the, the uh, treaty, the American Covenant of Human Rights that prohibited the death penalty to minors. Uh, so, there was an, a great problem, no? Uh, what, to, what do you think? You, you will punish him or not? Uh, well, uh, the, case, the case was so difficult because uh, they, they agree uh, that what is the defense of the United States in this case? No? It, it is in the commission, it's not compulsory, but it was a, a procedure against the United States because he, he, he will suffer the death penalty uh, for a crime that, uh, that he committed when he was 16 years old. No? So the defense of the United States in that process was, well, I'm not uh, violating uh, any, any human, human treaty, uh, any declaration of human rights, because in any declaration of human rights, you, you have the definition of what is a minor. No? The, the, well, never you say it should be 18 years or 21 years or 16 years. And for that state, I would put less, 16 years. And that's why we can apply the criminal law with the, the whole force that you usually have and I can punish him. That was the defense. But more or less, it, it is an interesting the case. It is quite interesting the case. I don't know. Uh, the most interesting part is uh, how the commission of, of the system, the American Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, Analyze what is a human uh, a, a use cogent, no? um, um, which kind of uh, rights could be. I don't know. I will give you now a eight minutes, eight mi seven minutes, seven minutes. If you, you have to check on internet this case, this case, and tell me how a uh, the the commission found a uh, ground under pine the uh, use cogens based in the what which theory Nat natural law public order custom or self evidence could be one of them but I want to show you how they how how they found what uh, what what did you think about well you have seven minutes from uh, from right now to check on internet this case and check how they the ground use coins let me see seven minutes Thank you. 
If you want the link, I put the link in the chat to the to the judgment. Try to find in that link directly the a search to the words use cogens. And remember, have you shared the link with everyone? And uh, yeah, now, yes. Okay, thanks.
Okay. One minute more. Just to check how the ground use cogens. Good. So, hey, you have raised your hand. Can you say me how they ground, how they justify use cogens? No one of you? I'm sorry, I wasn't um, raising my hand, but from what we got is, from what I got from the reading was that the commission concluded that <coughs> the state was acting contrary to international norm, which is which cogens, yeah. and by sentencing a minor to the death penalty. <laughs> yeah. So if they did, they would be acting against yeah, yeah, yeah that's the conclusion. Um, yeah, uh, he asked to change the, the laws to uh, Nevada, to the United States. Uh, I, will, uh, I will remember this is not a compulsory judgment, no? But how the commission uh, justified use cogens on natural law, on self-evidence, on customary law, or in, in public order. <laughs> yes, Naima, Omar. Uh, okay, so I found it in uh, paragraph 49, um, where it says that the commission defines the concept of discordance cogents as having been derived from ancient law concepts of a superior order of legal norms which positive law cannot contravene yeah so, okay uh, yeah good so in which theory i'd say natural law because no. of the <laughs> Guy, yes. Um, not not uh, the customary law theory. Customary law, why? So, um, if I just um, just give me a second. Um, <laughs> going by going by the the paragraph that Naima has quoted. Um, yeah. Uh, there. There are many others in the second part uh, of the, but yes, it, it, it helped, yeah. Yeah, so the paragraph goes on to quote that more particularly as customary international law rests in the consent of nations, the states that persistently object to a norm of customary international law is not bound to that norm. So, okay, disregarding that, Disregarding the statement or the part of the statement that says such a state is not bound to that norm, I think that statement already goes on to say that use cogens is international, you know, customary law. Yeah. But also bearing in mind the rationale or the defense of the US government. So the US government is trying to say that they can't be bound by this law because there's no consensus on the age of majority. Yeah. But the, the commission went on to say um, in one of those law paragraphs that um, it doesn't matter if there's, 
there's uh, there's no consistency but as long as someone who has committed an offense at the time when he was below the age of 18 then they are not to be sentenced to death for such a crime okay bernice um i think i agree with what both anaima and uh, mungai have said because when you look at the conclusion the first paragraph paragraph 84 rather the last sentence states that the commission is therefore of the view that a norm of international customary law has emerged prohibiting the execution of offenders under the age of 18 years at the time of their crime so i'd, cr- I'd classify it under the theory of customary law yeah okay yeah, yeah it, you're right yeah i think that that he wanted to say the same because he he have no longer the raise he his hand raised in any case he uh, Yes, yes, uh, and customary law. And how a customary law? But in a very positivistic uh, customary law, no? he, uh, the court used to say, uh, well, let's see one treaty and the things that the people say and the laws of that country and the custom of, um, or the tradition or the ancient law. And, and with this argument, he tried to put all the 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 justi- positive justifications of the past and of the present to say this is part of customary law but it's quite interesting one thing what uh, i don't know if you uh, there, there were two parts at the end of that part the, the link was another link to, that said go to the next part i don't know if someone of you uh, was able a uh, Uh, were able to 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 got the link in any case it is quite interesting the the this this case why because because uh, they say well nowadays there is no no limit to put any restriction on below Six, uh, 16 years or 18 years or 21 years to consider an adult yeah uh, or not or not the age is not part of this coherence but he said but this grow in that concept and now we can say that could should be up to a uh, up from 18 years 18 years from 18 years uh, 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 and ahead, uh, you will consider that this guy is an adult and uh, so it is quite <laughs> interesting because he, he realized that your scotians could be developed <laughs> yeah it could be developed no little by little well, the, the, the previous uh, experience uh, is a concept that is not static that we can develop that uh, uh, that's why th- this case is so interesting for understand what is use cogens and and also to understand a better human rights and how can human rights could be always improved and be perf- a, but the base we can say we can say the base a, of the human rights the most directly connection with the principal needs and potencies and nature should have some more stability more this this could be a conclusion of this lecture today i want to show you a list one part of uh, a you will have a, a read and a, an optional read also if you want to to be deeper in this part now i want to just mention just a mention of this because we will develop in the next lecture Uh, something about the slogan of the French Revolution because equality fraternity you remember no this was a part of a speech of Maximilien Robespierre uh, under organization of the National Guard no? he was a great speaker and he said under uniform engraved this word French people and below liberty equality fraternity the same words are inscribed on flags which bear the three colors of the nation it's related with the three colors of the nation no? and that's why the symbol 
at that time, there were many people that used so many other slogans, no? Phrases like la nation, la loi, le roi, eh, eh, the nation, the law, the king, no? Obviously not, not the commoners. Or the union, the force, the virtue, also, no? Eh, by the Masonic Lodge. Eh, <laughs> or also, for say, equality, justice, eh, strange equality or justice. Uh, or liberté, sûreté, propriété. No? Uh, liberty, security, property. Well, that the, the most popular by far uh, of the slogans was that. And the, the, the whole slogan uh, ends uh, from that time also liberté, égalité, fraternité, o la no? Or, or uh, the death, if you don't follow this, no? And this more or less is, uh, as, as Robert Spire said, no, this is have to be with the three colors of the flag of France. Uh, well, and this is uh, quite clever. All the, the 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 main foundation, the ultimate uh, foundation, the ultimate end aim uh, of the human rights is also the the the, the people, the person. The equal dignity and, and the freedom, equal freedom, and all these kind of things that we have seen. No? But for apply, for apply this to um, when these are abstract ideas to some specific cases, we have to be more technical, and we have to apply uh, the principles that we have seen in, in jurisprudence of uh, equality proportionality and probably many other but these two we have to be quite technical and there were a lot of efforts in the past uh, in the courts of the past to to how to apply to the, in, in these principles to each case and that's uh, i think that we will see in the next uh, lecture how to be technical applying this kind of principles to each case. But for today, it is enough because we are on time. <laughs>